This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 68, covering Daredevil, season 2, episode 12, The Dark at the End of the Tunnel. Welcome back, Defenders, to episode 68 of Defenders TV Podcast, Daredevil Season 2, episode 12, The Dark at the End of the Tunnel. We're almost at the end of the tunnel for, for Daredevil Season 2. Uh, one more episode to go after this in the penultimate episode of Daredevil Season 2. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hi, I'm one of your other hosts, John. And yeah, what are we going to find at the end of this tunnel? Um, something undescribable? Shelob, maybe? <laughs> uh, Gollum? Tunnel. <laughs> or are we going to find uh, Mordor, maybe? Or the hands equivalent of it? One thing we do know, we already know uh, that Black Sky is revealed and may be not at the end of this uh, long journey and tunnel. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Most likely it's going to be the hand with some sharp pointy knives directed in our direction uh, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, you may have noticed that Chris, unfortunately, isn't joining us for this episode of Daredevil. Uh, he will be back next week. He's at the Google I.O. event in the U.S. this week. Uh, he will be back in time for our final episode of Daredevil Season 2, which we will be broadcasting live next that week. That is correct, yeah. Back onto YouTube and Google+, Plus, where you can find us as well. Yeah, we, we're giving it another go. Uh, we've really enjoyed doing the, um, the, the podcasts up on YouTube, uh, and recording ourselves. We probably need to still do a few tweaks and, and changes here and there, but we, we enjoy the format. Um, it certainly keeps us on our toes. Uh, and of course, uh, it'd be great if, uh, our listeners could join us if they're around and want to be glued in front of, um, their computer on, on a Saturday morning. Hopefully it's raining outside on that day <laughs> and so we'll be doing that at 11 o'clock on saturday morning saturday 28th of may mm -hmm. uh, we will go live and do our podcast if you uh, happen to be still enjoying your long lie-in on the saturday morning and um, then we will release the podcast as normal as usual up on our podcast channels, I suppose. Uh, to find those, if you are an iTunes user, you can just go to our direct link at defenderstvpodcast.com forward slash iTunes. Please just uh, find us there, subscribe, and then any of the podcasts that we put up there will miraculously appear in your feed. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you don't happen to like the Apple and are a bit more of the, the Android, then you can just search Defenders TV Podcast on any other good podcast catcher such as podcast addict beyond pod or player fm um, and again subscribe to us there and in fact if you wish please by all means leave a review mm -hmm. on any of those services so that we can um, get your feedback uh, on our podcast um, which is really helpful for us to help um, tailor any aspects that we need to or it helps other people who haven't yet found the podcast to to find us and listen and and give us a tryout and um, so any reviews or subscribes is absolutely very much appreciated. Yeah, and as we come into the final episode of Daredevil Season 2, we will be going on a bit of a break after this episode. We've been uh, going back to back, really, with uh, Jessica Jones, with Agent Carter, and then with Daredevil. Uh, probably the longest run of podcasts we've had on Defenders TV Podcast with those those three shows back to back. It's about yeah, 30 shows, I think. Going back to November, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2015, dare I say. That's um, right. Another year, another age. <laughs> and, and in fact, we're rapidly catching Catching up on our sister podcast, Gotham TV podcast, with all the uh, Marvel shows now being released. Uh, it's amazing how quickly that Defenders TV podcast has caught up to Gotham, which is now 71 years of age, or should I say podcasts of age. Podcasts of age, yeah. Um, and we're up to now, obviously, uh, 68 podcasts of age for Defenders. Yeah, we've been running a Gotham TV podcast for over two and a half years now, and uh, and we've caught up within just one year on our Marvel podcast. So uh, just to show the difference between the volume of stuff that we do for our DC coverage and our Marvel coverage, we've obviously also covered all the Marvel movies uh, coming up to uh, to Doctor Strange, which comes out in October of this year. <laughs> all windy mountainous paths lead to Doctor Strange, October 2016. Yeah, so as John mentioned, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. We will be doing some episodes during the summer break up until uh, Luke Cage is released on the 30th of September of this year. We'll be hopefully covering a couple of the old Doctor Strange movies. As well as the animated version of Doctor Strange as well. Mm -hmm. 
We'll hopefully also be covering uh, the new X-Men film that's coming out and some other little bits and pieces that we'll be throwing in. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get those. You can also join us over on our Facebook group to keep up with what we're doing. Uh, just go to facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV podcast or always all the way through following us. You can also email us at any time. Email us at feedback at Defenders TV podcast.com with your thoughts on the season of Daredevil, on any of the movies that we've covered, on any of the shows that we've covered. We're always available there to chat. Uh, and if you get it in time for a podcast, we'll always put it in our feedback section on the podcast as well. Uh, thanks so much again for joining us. I think it's time to get into this episode of Daredevil. This episode was directed by Eros Lin, who's directed other episodes of Daredevil so far this season. And the episode was written by Douglas Petrie, one of the showrunners, uh, along with Lauren Smith Hisrich, who's written a couple of other episodes uh, earlier on in the season. So, John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the synopsis for this episode, episode 12 of season two, The Dark at the End of the Tunnel? Sure. Stick is saved from Electra's wrath by Daredevil, but is abducted by the Hand after they crash their battle, forcing the threesome to fight for one another. However, their brief alliance does not last as Murdoch vows to find Stick, whilst Natchez vows to kill him and anyone who gets in her way. As Daredevil goes underground to save his old friend and mentor, Karen follows a new story to profile Frank Castle's previous life and character as a research journalist at the New York Bulletin. As she seeks to uncover Castle's background, she goes to his former commander in Afghanistan, Ray Schoonover, to find out more about Frank's background, only to be confronted with a sickening reality that he is the blacksmith. Elsewhere, in the abandoned tunnels of New York, Daredevil's rescue of Stick reveals the missing link in Nobu's and Stick's pursuit of Electra Natchez, as her true darkness is revealed to be the black sky. Finally, as Schoonover takes Karen out to the local woods to execute her, an ambush by Castle turns the tables on the blacksmith, who is in turn executed. One bullet, one kill. And a new identity for Frank Castle is created in the candy store of the Punisher's Armory. Great stuff, John. Thank you very much for that one. That's a really good, uh, really good synopsis of the episode. The two reveals covered in there, the, the reveal of the armory as well, the huge battle at the beginning of the episode. Loads of stuff going on in this one. Massive. Lots and lots to, uh, of, of reveals here. And in fact, dare I say it, I think that leads me nicely into one of my first points. Get in there. And if you're a new listener, um, the way we cover our shows is to look at our five top points of the episode. They can be good, bad, or indifferent, mm-hmm. uh, and we cover them each. And then finally, we say whether or not we defend this episode of Daredevil. Um, but my first point is just the whole identity fest that goes on here. I mean, this is just identity, 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 mm-hmm. reveal, reveal, reveal. Um, and it was it was really good. It, I mean, it really uh, helped sort of culminate a lot of the different story arcs, a lot of, of different questions that were being asked. You know, in particular with regards to Electra, we finally get to uh, understand um, the interest of the Hand in in Electra uh, and and their pursuit in New York of, of this goal that she is the Black Sky. Yeah, we also see a lot of flashbacks. Um, in this back to stick uh, training and teaching and counseling a lecturer mm. uh, while she grows up and in fact um, allowing her to become part of the Natchez family the ambassadors uh, in order to um, sort of grow and develop away from the the battle that's raging between the chaste and the hand presumably absolutely and also um, protect her from the hand is what it feels like that they're not going to be able to get their hands on her while he's protecting her yeah absolutely and we also get to see the identity of the blacksmith, the big bad who's been playing off uh, the New York Irish, the dogs of hell and the cartels, uh, which obviously as well at the carousel massacre led to the, the, the identity being born for the Punisher. Mm-hmm. And both of those have a deeper connection than we first thought. So it is. And I think, you know, a bit of wild speculation actually came to fruition on our yeah. podcast where, you know, there was some military connection here. I think it was Chris that called it out that it, it could be the, the general, the, uh, the colonel, the, the commander in Afghanistan or of, um, of Frank 
Frank Castle. Mm-hmm. And and I it think is. You, you called it out because you called it the drug connection in Afghanistan. I think that's where you got well, your idea. Yeah, from. no, that's yeah. why I thought. And the fact that the guy with the blonde hair does also call out Frank Castle's name. Mm-hmm. It seems that there's some something there that is a connection. It wasn't just simply um, them coming to to shoot up the boat. It, yeah. it really seemed a bit more personal than that. And, and I think and, I called your theory absolutely mental and told you that you were completely wrong. So I was quite <laughs> shocked here at uh, Skinover's uh, uh, turn. I thought it was quite cool, but, but uh, I was yeah. quite surprised. So those, those identities of the blacksmith and the punisher uh, really interlinked here. And actually, there is a reference made by the blacksmith to Kandahar and what happened in Kandahar, which we're not told here, uh, which would be really, really interesting. I wonder whether there's anything in that that would really add another bit of juicy flavor to um to the punisher and the and the reason why actually this attack on Frank Castle seemed so much more um personal um, than simply him being in the wrong place at the wrong time and um, it seemed as though maybe um you know uh the general i keep calling him the general but is he a general i think he's a colonel but but roy uh, schoonover that he may have even invited frank to be a part of his post war post afghanistan plans so i'm wondering whether that's part of the reason why the the blacksmith is so bitter about the punisher um, and, and and everything there so that's really um, a huge amount of uh, reveals here about people's motives and identity in this episode definitely definitely and you have taken most of my points uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so i'll probably go back over them uh definitely the kandahar one i'm wondering whether that's a connection to um to nukes same situation in season two, season one of uh, of Jessica Jones, where he's come back from war. He's got his whole crew are after him and trying to bring him back into the fold again. Um, so I'm wondering if that's the connection there. Once you've gone to the military, you certainly don't come back from it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. They're definitely got to follow you down and either kill you or uh, or induct you back into it. It seems in the Marvel universe anyway. Um, what I really wanted to go back to was just obviously our reveal here of the black sky. Big time, yeah. This has kind of been hanging over Daredevil since season one, since Stick killed that young kid with an arrow. Um, back in season, back in season one, the, the kid that was transported over to New York in the container turned yeah, out to be the black sky. Yeah. And at the time we thought it was the Yakuza doing this. Uh, mm-hmm. There was no mention of the hand, exactly. even though I think there may have been a few suspicions back in the day. Yeah, but the bigger reveal here is that not only is she the black sky, but the black sky is in fact the leader of the hand. They all bow down and worship. Electra immediately when they find out that she is the black sky, the one that, that's been prophesied to lead them effectively. Um, I love that Electra takes this on instantly and realizes that that's the reason why she's good at murder. <laughs> that's the reason why she's a great assassin is because she's born to be evil effectively. Uh, it does explain so much about what we talked about all the way throughout the season here with, um, with her being pretty crazy and, and being, you know, trying to work with Daredevil, but not being able to uh, live by his rules, not being able to live by his kind of sense of a moral code. She doesn't have one. She leads the evil gang of the hand. Um, interesting stuff, though. Yeah, I mean, and to be honest, they follow her blindly because even to their detriment, um, they do get a sigh in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, I did think that was really hilarious as she's rescuing Stick and um, that one of the um, ninjas of the hand comes out and then instantly kneels to sort of uh, and bows to her. Uh, and she obviously is trying to escape with Stick um, and sticks a, a sigh straight into his neck. Yeah, and yeah. so um, his loyalty got him nowhere. Absolutely. We see full use of the size in this episode. Uh, ah, uh, loads, yeah. yeah. Electra's trademark weapons from the comic books. Uh, there's the, you, you mentioned size in the eyeball is the oh. uh, the one that stands out <laughs> to me. Sigh in the eye. Exactly. Oh. That's, uh, that's phenomenal in the opening fight sequence with... Uh, where she's taking out the hand, trying to get to stick effectively. So uh, that's quite that's quite a fun little uh, scene. Yeah, I think I've got to bring in another um, of my points here, uh, which is definitely the cringe eek moments. Um, anything to do with eyes, um, especially with pointy stuff, mm-hmm. is a really big like eek sort of cringe look away moment. And we do see a sigh straight through the eye. Um, 
I know I'm a great poet, but nonetheless, um, <laughs> yeah, that just made me kind of shriek slightly. Absolutely. And then the other is definitely the torture of stick, uh, with the, um, kind of bamboo, uh, sticks and, and points. It's almost like little daggers. They almost look like kebab sticks oh, that you would use. So bam- painful. Straight between uh, the fingernail and the finger. Mm. Really, really, oh, awful. Like, really cringeworthy. Oh, absolutely. Like, in the sense of you just had to look away. It was so bad. Um, So it was, uh, you know, really difficult violence for me uh, this week uh, with both the eye and under the fingernails uh, coming into uh, this episode as other means of violence, torture, uh, and uh, bloodshed. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I definitely don't think it's it could be any worse than The Punisher uh, in episode 11. Uh, his, his violence was much more brutal, but yeah, any kind of torture, anything like that, it really got me, kind of giving me the shivers. Uh, I do like that Stick stands up after the torture and just pulls them out of his hands as if nothing had happened. You know, he's, uh, he's just that kind of powerful guy. Really, really like that. Um, but going back to one of your first points as part of my second point, <laughs> but yeah, the reveal of the blacksmith is other, is also huge. You know, you mentioned it, uh, partially, but the reveal here of the blacksmith where he says that effectively you still think this is about some kind of drug deal in the park. This has nothing to do with that. There's so much more to this Frank doesn't know about. You. Absolutely. This is clearly what's going to be the springboard into Frank's own series, into the Punisher, uh, telling his story. You know, uh, I was kind of worried uh, as we were getting towards the end of the show. We've obviously watched these episodes week by week and halfway through the series of Uh, of our coverage of the show the announcement came there's going to be a punisher tv show and then we get to this episode and you kind of go oh okay well they've revealed uh who killed his family they've revealed who's behind it uh we know who the blacksmith is uh, and frank's just killed him so uh how are they gonna really talk about that in the next series of punisher but i like this It's, it's setting him on the path and telling him some details about his past uh giving him a focus but not necessarily saying this is the only thing you need to focus on so there will be a path for frank to go down and speaking of the drug deal that's gone wrong, um, on the ship there is the number 227, which references the issue that begins Frank Miller's Born Again arc in Daredevil, number 227. Thanks for that, Chris. <laughs> I know, I've turned into Mr. Easter Egg. No, I, I saw the number on the side of the ship and I thought that's really uh, different from obviously the, the usual names that would be given to a ship like uh, Sweet Potato or, mm-hmm. um, you know... Um, you can tell John doesn't have a ship. <laughs> <laughs> HMS Pinafore, uh, all right. those kind of things. You know, none of that going on. Um, and I, I was intrigued. I kind of checked it out. And yes, it's uh, Frank Miller's um, Born Again arc as or the start of it uh, in issue 227 very good and speaking of comics that oh, there's also that great reference at the end of this episode where punisher walks into his armory that's uh absolutely taken from punisher's armory obviously uh he's walked into a location that now has him able to be completely tooled up for his takedown of the rest of hell's kitchen if that's what he wanted to do the rest of new york actually or maybe the eastern seaboard of the u.s if he wanted to looking at the amount of weapons in there yeah there was something hugely um horror movie about that cabin in the woods uh, Mm -hmm. to quote uh, a horror movie (laughs) a lot of tongue in cheek horror movie by joss whedon in fact Mm -hmm. um andrew goddard andrew goddard the creator of the show exactly so um but that candy store within was really good and i have to say i i I did absolutely love that moment between the blacksmith and the punisher where he says you know you've entered into a, a candy store um you kind of start expect the Punisher of Frank Castle to start going, you know, hammer and tongue on the blacksmith with nails, drills, saws, chisels, you name it, uh, angle grinders, a la Luke Cage, maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether they, uh, I don't whether th- they'd have the abs to support that. The <laughs> no, I don't think he would either. But you, you kind of expect that, and I love just Frank's response to that, which is, you know, you taught me uh, one bullet, one kill, and it's just pure execution style bullet through the head, which we see a lot of as well, mm-hmm. even in that brief moment. We do see a lot uh, of his head as Roy's brains are. Um, <laughs> 
splattered across said candy store. Uh-huh. Um, so really, um, a fantastic little, um, bit of interaction and, and dialogue between the blacksmith and the punisher. And of course, this leads just to what I think is a fantastic sort of, um, Netflix, uh, interpretation of Frank's skull on, on, on his armor, on, on his flat jacket, which we see in the armory. He just turns his head round and, and you see the, the, this, this black jacket that has the leather overlapped and it all is in the shape of, of the, the classic Punisher skull. Um, and you can imagine it just maybe being painted white there and it would give that profile. So I think hats off for a Netflix for, for, for doing it in that way. It makes it realistic. It makes it look, um, scary as well. It's almost like it had eyes, like beady piercing eyes on it, just part of the design. Um, and it, it looked fantastic. I thought it was a real good upgrade to an interpretation of that design for, um, I suppose this Marvel Netflix, uh, universe. Yeah, absolutely. This is perfect. I thought this was such a great touch as our friends over on the Welcome to Level 7 podcast would call it. This is the perfect MCUing of a character, uh, making it look realistic, making it look like something that Frank would wear. I think in the past they've used things like, uh, you know, a t-shirt that Frank's son gave him uh, that had a skull on the front of it, you know, that kind of thing as being the way of getting the skull into the costume. Uh, In this case, it's a flak jacket. It's protection for Frank. We have in the past obviously seen him wearing a flak jacket. So I like this choice here that he is going to uh, put this on and this will uh, show the Punisher s- skull symbol in a very cool way. Really enjoyed that. Very nice touch. Yeah, excellent touch. Derek, what's your next point? I have to say, I really enjoyed Elektra in this episode and her kind of twisting and turning uh, against Stick. It's great to see the opening of the episode where you have the flashback to her as a child, sh- showing that Stick was just as forceful with her as he was with Matt in, in season one. Yeah. You know, very much kind of showing, saying to her, you know, the, uh, the limp wrist that she's holding. Uh, if you do that, you're never going to have a proper punch. Uh, these are real punches. Those ones are wrong ones. Uh, but we do see her make her first kill, which she mentioned earlier on in the season. We see her take out one of the sparring partners that she has, uh, with good reason. He is coming at her with a knife. Um, but I wonder if that was possibly a training move that was trying to be pulled in her by stick, sending in this guy with a knife, uh, see if she'll just take him down. But in fact, she kills him uh, and slices his throat open, not even kills him. You know, she's only 12 at the time or 11 or 12 kind of kind of age group. So pretty brutal. But I love that kind of opening sequence leading in and flicking straight over into her attacking stick. And um, it, it grows on from there where she's effectively turning to to Matt and saying, I will go after him. This is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill this old man finally. And if you get in my way, I'm going to kill you too. A huge twist for the Electra character. Uh, the fact that she's going to go through Matt if he blocks her attack on stick is huge, really, isn't it? Definitely. And, and it only gets interrupted because the hand comes in, spoils their, I suppose, party, um, that they're having. And, um, you know, suddenly they're fighting for one another again. Mm. And it, as you say, that, that move all the way through this episode for me, actually, um, of, of Electra and, and Stick and in fact, Daredevil's or Matt's, uh, relationship, how it, 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 it is in the present and how it was in the past, particularly for Electra and Stick, really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was one of the big standouts for me and um, just how Electra intent on destruction and killing but in the end is the savior of stick um, and i think you really see in the flashback where um you know he essentially kills one of his own uh who uh is set on killing electra like he actually protects her uh, and she doesn't realize that you know he takes her to um the the nachos to to protect her so that they can have their own uh, child um, and to keep her out of this other world, this world between the chaste and the hand. Mm-hmm. I, I really like that. And I love that Stick has, you know, Ellie and Matty as his two little uh, pet names for his, his two um, students, in effect. And yeah. that's a really nice kind of connection on all of this. And I must say, I, I was surprised that she didn't kill Stick in the end. But having said that, I liked how it turned out and I liked how Stick was so matter of fact, you know, that you did this because 
Matt came here and saved you from being who you could be. Um, so there's still that internal battle that Electra's going to have between not killing and killing, fulfilling what essentially the Hand considers to be her destiny, which is to lead them and be an assassin and a brutal killer, uh, whereas fighting that urge, in a sense, as Matt has done. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that, that the way the stick says it to her is that Matt believes in you. He's chosen to think you're, you've got good inside you. Earn that is, is effectively what he says to her. It's a really mm-hmm. nice touch, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I, again, another great moment with her is, is the kiss to Matt after telling him that she's going to kill him. You know, yeah. it's, uh, that's only, only Electra can do that. The, uh, if you get in my way, I'll, t- I'll kill you too and then kiss him. Beautiful. A really yeah, good, really yeah. good moment. Uh, John, do you want to give us your next point? Yeah, this is an aspect that just didn't feel quite right for me in this episode. Okay. Um, and it does actually link to, um, the reveal of the blacksmith as the uh, former commander of Frank Castle. Um, but, but it's more just how that came about. Um, just because it was so connected back to the fact that Karen was able to stay and remain on the docks uh, after the ship had been blown up and essentially there for the whole of the evening whilst the police are recovering bodies and that. And she sees the glimpse of one of, um, the blacksmith's sort of second in command, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, with, with deep blonde hair and with a burn, uh, across uh, his face. And she sees a picture of the same man on the wall of, um, Schoonover's, uh, study with him and with Frank Castle. Yeah. And she makes that connection. And I think for me, um, it just didn't quite chime for me, uh, ultimately in the end for two reasons. I think first that Karen being at the crime scene, I could understand initially, but she was then there for the whole time. She gets this glimpse, which means she recognizes that body on the dock being pulled out of the water, being put into the body bag with the man in the hospital bed with the, the, the general and then with Frank Castle. And she, makes that connection and the blacksmith r- realizes that and so abducts her and goes off to execute her. Yeah. And and I think for me it was just that I could see that it was necessary for the story given that there's only one episode left. Mm-hmm. But given that the blacksmith was this big bad even bigger and badder than Madame Gao in some extent given her respect for him, given um that he had managed to sort of break all the other mobs that were dealing in drugs the irish the cartels and the bikers that this seemed a bit convenient Mm -hmm. for me that karen was set off on a profile of frank castle she goes to the only person that knows him from his history uh, and used to command him and because she was there on the dock um, she recognized this and obviously connected all the dots I felt something different could have been done. I don't know what. I have to say, I put my hands up to that. But it just kind of didn't feel right for me. Um, and that was just one of the slight negatives that I had with this episode. So Yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's a bit of a weird one. It could have been fixed by, to me, for a couple of little quick lines. Um, if you'd maybe set up that Karen is there trying to make sure that the body of Frank Castle is found. Um, that that's the reason why she stayed overnight, waiting for the bodies to be uncovered. That's one way of doing it. But she actually says, after staying there for the whole night, she asks Mahoney whether he's found the body of Castle. Yeah. So why didn't, why isn't she saying that she was there to find the body of Castle? It was very much of a, it seemed like an afterthought for her that, that uh, he would find the body. The other way of doing it is, she goes back to the uh, to the newspaper, to the bulletin, and maybe she could have seen some of the crime scene photographs there and made a connection while searching through photographs, doing the diligent reporter piece where she could have made the connection back to Frank's file. I, I think that's it. I mean, I think for me, my notes basically was Karen is still at the crime scene, question mark. You know, <laughs> why? Um, a, it's dangerous. B, it's contaminating evidence. And, and C, she is ultimately still a member of the public. Um, and it, she's at a murder scene. Mm-hmm. Or even if you want to say that she's a member of the press, they wouldn't let the press in. And so my feeling is that, you know, when we talk about the show having a reality, uh-huh. um, it, it, it's interesting because I think sometimes we talk about that with regards to things like 
uh, Frank Castle's skull on, on yeah. his thing and how that looks like it could be in the real world. And then some of the actual real world stuff is treated in a way that would bear no resemblance to what happens in reality. And I understand that. It is still ultimately a superhero and a, and a graphic novel show. But um I just felt it could have been set up in a different way because ultimately it suddenly felt very convenient how the blacksmith was revealed. Yeah, this scene particularly almost felt like they were... Uh, they were saying the reason why Karen was there the whole time was because she didn't have a lift home. It was basically the only thing they were saying. It was like the neck, the um, Mahoney's second in command arrives, and that's the point where he says, uh, "Would you mind taking her home to her house to a second in command and giving her a lift?" You know, it's like as if she was waiting around for a lift for hours at the docks, watching bodies being pulled out at a crime scene. That's not what happens. That's that doesn't happen in real life. There's no particular reason why she would be there. And in fact, if I if I understand correctly, Mahoney doesn't actually get on very well with Karen. He doesn't like Foggy. He doesn't like Matt. He doesn't like their law practice. While she has been involved and they has been taking care of her in the past, um, maybe even just explaining that the reason why he's keeping her there is because she got kidnapped by Frank and he wants to make sure she's surrounded by cops and nobody can get at her again. You know, but again, they didn't mention any of that uh, until after number of hours at the docks. I, I think in most circumstances, you would have sent a squad car away to take her home. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it could have been done through the newspapers or something, as you say. Um, and maybe ultimately it didn't even need to be uh, Karen who was at the blacksmiths. Obviously, off screen, we do have the fact that Frank Castle has tracked him as well. Mm. Whether he's been tracking Karen, we don't know yet. But Karen already knows that he's bloodthirsty from the diner last mm-hmm. week. Um, that moment where he closes the door, you could argue, does it or doesn't it need to be there? Because we've had that moment between these two characters. So maybe it could just simply have been Frank tracking down his former commander in Afghanistan because he recognized the voice of the guy from the picture. Well, I mean, look, it's an, it's a, a slight minor thing, which mm-hmm. I just felt in a sense, it felt too convenient in terms of the thread that ran yeah. through. And given that it was the reveal of the blacksmith who had been this big bad operating behind the scenes that led to the carousel. Yeah. And obviously Madame Gao very worried about him uh, that all of a sudden he's out in the open and he's gone. And so that's why it just didn't chime right for me. And that's, that's the only reason. Yeah. No, I think. I think Karen had to be there at the end of this episode. Remember, this whole story of the blacksmith has been so central to her character for the entire season of the show. Um, we couldn't have that happen off screen with just the Punisher only being present. She has to take this back in some way to Foggy and Matt. She has to be knowledgeable of what actually happened here. And I think it needs to close off the door for Karen's Page's character to uh, to Frank. So if he doesn't come back next episode and goes off into his own series, uh, that she doesn't have to follow him. So she's kind of set that up there. Um, but I think it's necessary for the character. It makes sense that she wouldn't stop investigating the case of Frank, even though she did need a kick up the, up the arse from the editor at, uh, at the bulletin to keep the, following that. But that's her character. That's what she would do. I totally get that. Well, from one of your least favorite uh, moments of the episode to one of my favorites, uh, I love Daredevil going underground uh, into the former railway stops in uh, in New York City. A uh, very cool shot as he drops drops through the um, the manhole cover into the underground to fight the hand uh, as he's all lit up. A really cool shot, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Really good. And um, the spotlight from the manhole cover mm-hmm. is excellent. And just with all the arches as well. Yeah. Uh, really nice, uh, really nice scene. Yeah. And I love the touch here showing that the hand are learning uh, just by watching and just by f- f- fighting against Daredevil. They're learning that the way he battles against them is to monitor how their, how their, uh, swords swish in the air effectively. So they put the swords away. Uh, really nice. And then they all start to retreat to tell the other members of the hand, this is how you beat him. You make sure he can't hear you. Uh, leading to another one of the best moments in this, uh, in the episode, uh, where we have Stick giving Matt directions just by whispering in the air effectively. It's almost like Stick's superpower that there is some kind of, uh, mental connection between the two of them. Absolutely. Like, yeah. I like how this is filmed as the two leaders of the hand are interrogating Stick and he's just kind of whispering, just his lips are moving. He is saying the words out loud, we hear them, um, but they don't seem to hear them. So it's almost like there's some kind of telepathy between the two of them. 
I do like that little touch there where Stick is, is speaking under his breath, telling Matt, uh, quite lowly in English, talking out loud. Um, and the guys, the leaders of the hand can't actually hear what he's saying. It's almost like as if there's a connection, some kind of telepathy between himself and Matt, where he tells Matt to just, just wait for them to breathe. And then he'll be able to find where the, uh, where the hand ninjas are when they're coming to attack him. Uh, cause he can't track them by their heartbeat because they're slowing that. He can't track them by their swords because they've put them away. A uh, nice little touch and led to some of my favorite fight sequences in this episode i want to i want to watch that fight sequence another couple of times uh as as matt catches some of the ninjas mid-air as they're as they're exhaling um, and just punches them directly at the right moment during the fight i thought they were really cool really really well shot scenes and again 12 episodes into this season 13 episodes in the first and another type of fight scene we've never seen before and uh, just as matt is encountering these guys with different touches it's kind of almost you know changing the dance of the fight considerably just by because of how Matt is reacting to their uh, to their attacks. Yeah, definitely. And even when Nobu has confront I've said it correctly this time. Um not Nobu, not um Queen Amidala's uh planet, uh but actually the character in Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Um Chris I, will be so proud. Absolutely. Uh, I'm so proud. Uh, I love the fact that Nobu here, just the way he he bends the knee to her uh, and there's that face off and, and Stick has that moment as well where um he says we we've got to get out of here, you know, all is lost in effect, uh, to to Matt. Um is is a really good little scene uh, which which shows that kind of connection between Stick and Matt as well. Mm. And I also love the fact that Nobu calls it it um and the lecturer is just kind of like if you call me it one more time I absolutely loved her delivery of, of that line. Really really cool. Mm-hmm. Um the real nice aspect of this episode for me was the fact that you know Stick is the dick. He is um harsh. He's pretty uh, dis- disciplined and, and and will discipline them really um harshly if need be. He he really um gives them a hard time. He doesn't ease up on them. You know, in a sense, it's that student teacher relationship where as a student you kind of go. I've had enough of this. I just don't like you. And you kind of get that. You know, Stick, in effect, has fallen out with his two protégés mm. um, here. But nonetheless, there is this bond. And actually, when they come back down to it, there is, um, and they can see that Stick has been this father figure for Matt and this protector for Electra. Uh, and it really comes out. And um, as I say, I think this is a really nice aspect of this episode for Definitely. me. Uh, just how that's drawn out um, the ups and downs over the course of this episode from Electra, for example, wanting to kill him to essentially saving him by the end um, with, with Matt saying coming to his rescue and, and being true to pursue the hand and follow him in order to save um stick and ultimately at the end of this you know we have the hand absolutely realizing uh, and learning that daredevil is an issue and i think nobu says daredevil must die at the end that's you right know? That's and right. say all the way through this we see them learning about how to fight him and so on and in the end it's also the resolution that he must die one of the other things i really liked was just how stick got his torturer that he was able to bite his ear off uh, and really deliver justice, uh, bloody, <laughs> bitey justice uh-huh. back to to his torturer who'd been sticking those bamboo things up his, um, oh, sorry, between his fingernails, I should say. Um, so really, really good, I thought. Yeah, definitely. And another lovely touch in this episode. Uh, as you said, Stick has alienated both of his protégés uh, that he worked with many, many years ago. And another nice touch here is that he actually says to Matt, Finally, uh, he says to him, you did good kid. I'm proud of you. That's, that's a, a very unusual thing for Stick to say. Generally a pretty uh, abrasive kind of character and quite cool that he actually does give Matt a bit of praise here. Yeah, definitely. Really good. So John, do you have a final point for us? I do. It is just Foggy and Matt's exchange in, um, the, back at the office Mm -hmm. yeah really awkward uh, but just really a great moment between the two it it resolves uh, a lot between these two characters but ultimately it's one where we see them drifting apart um 
But it's also kind of quite facelistic, I thought. And, um, you know, as Foggy comes in, Matt goes, well, I, I can, I can go. And Foggy's like, no, no, I, I'm, I'm only need to pick something up. Yeah. And he says, there's a month's electricity and then it will be all cold and dark, <laughs> like really kind of, um, down and, and out from, from Foggy Nelson. And, um, you know, that the, there is this opportunity of, well, should we give it one last go at working together? Mm. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, we have this whole thing at the end where Foggy says, I hope, I hope you would ask me, but I was relieved when you didn't. Mm. Um, the last step was us both admitting it. Um, we're done. Like, absolutely. This feels like the end of, uh, Nelson and Murdoch, uh, advocates at law Mm -hmm. you know really um which is a shame because at the same time i do like that last bit where foggy gives the advice about the abandoned subway tunnels to really help matt uh, do his thing and track stick even though he doesn't know anything about it he's always willing to help Mm -hmm. matt apologizes for not turning up at, at the hospital not seeing him and you know, it's such a half arsed apology. It though. is really, and but it, it, I had it's, things to do. Uh, it's just you know, done, just and been... that's the sad thing about it is that Foggy and Nelson are are, are no more in terms of lawyers together, and mm-hmm. um, they've drifted apart. And Our it's, little avocados, yeah, squished and made into guacamole. Mm-hmm. Pretty much, um, you know. But I, I did really like that 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 encounter between them i thought it was a bit poignant i thought it was awkward um, and and it, it promised the opportunity of them getting back together but ultimately realizing that as foggy said we're, we're done and 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 it was over for them definitely and as we talked about in the last couple of episodes you know matt himself has become quite a difficult character to be on the side of um you know what i did like about the scene as well as kind of putting the end to that relationship with two of, between the two of them i'm sure they're going to become back together as friends by the way uh, as we get into season three but what the scene also did was give foggy a little bit of confidence in himself um showing that he's suddenly become a bit more confident without matt in the picture he's been able to realize that while the trial of the punisher as he says uh was a total shitstorm uh it didn't go the way they wanted it to the guy went to prison um got released had had another big attack on on new york city none of that really mattered because it proved that he's really good at his job he is actually a very good lawyer when let off the leash by matt uh, effectively so now it looks like he's going off to work for hogarth definitely uh that's probably where he's going to end off in either the the defenders that's going to be his connection in there or in the next season of daredevil which hasn't been announced yet yeah, so it was really, really good moment, I mm-hmm. think, and yeah. a sad moment, but a good one. But nice to know where where Foggy's going to end up uh, as we get as we come closer to the defenders. Exactly, uh, Derek. Do you have any notes for this episode? I do. Along with our farewell to the blacksmith, we also say goodbye to Ben Ulrich's car. Um, I think that's pretty <laughs> much been total, doesn't it? I think so. The car was truly rammed. Yes. Um, that's one of my notes. It was a burnout T-boning, um, of epic pr- proportions <laughs> the by, T-bone takedown. yeah, the yeah. T-bone takedown, uh, by the Punisher of, um, Ben Ulrich's car, mm-hmm. RIP, smashed into bits, upended, I suppose, onto its roof. Yeah, yeah, no more Earth, Wind, and Fire in uh, in in Daredevil. Uh, another thing I really liked in the episode was as uh, the Punisher Frank Castle walks into the armory. Uh, it seems like we heard possibly the first proper strains of the Punisher theme tune. There really seemed to be a proper tune, uh, which could easily be used for the Daredevil season coming up. As he walked in there, quite a cool tune actually. Really, really liked that. And my final note, I had to look up who the character was that was watching on Electra in, uh, in the, while she was sparring, uh, under the tutelage of, of Stick. Chris was right. A couple of episodes ago, he mentioned there's a whole gang of the cast that are, um, that work with Stick in, uh, the fight against the hand. Uh, one of those is Star. And that's who the, the character was in the background. Wasn't named in the episode, wasn't named over on IMDb. Uh, this is Star, one of the members of, uh, of Stick's closest ally, like Stone, uh, who we saw in season one, uh, unfortunately didn't survive past his first encounter with Electra. Is that the one that Stick killed or yeah. that Electra killed? No, the one that Stick killed. Uh, the one that Stick, uh, stabbed. With, with his samurai sword. With his samurai yeah. sword, yeah. Uh, so that was Star. Uh, Chris had, had listed them all off a couple of episodes ago. One of the episodes that you weren't here for, John. Uh, Chris yeah. had listed no, them all I, off. I heard it. 
Yeah, quite quite cool. Uh, but also, the actor who played him was Lawrence Mason, who uh, who played Tintin in the uh, in the wonderful nineteen uh, nineties film The Crow. Uh, so I recognised him pretty well. I knew there was something about him that I should be looking up on IMDb when when I watched the episode. But that's quite cool. So we did get another member of the cast or the chase as we uh, as we fought about on our on our previous episode. What do you call them? Which is the right name for them? Um, so, John, I think that brings us to a close on our episode. Do you defend this episode of Daredevil, Season 2, Episode 12, The Dark at the End of the Tunnel? I do defend this episode of Daredevil. I give it four size to the eye out of five. Oh. Um, I think this was a really good episode. I really, really enjoyed the intermingling of, of storylines uh, of Stick, Electra, and Matt. Uh, I think all the way through this, I just really enjoyed this. I loved the reveals that Electro was Black Sky, um, was the it that the Hand were looking for and had been tracking all this time. Um, I loved uh, the reveal of the blacksmith and who he was, um, and just then the Punisher coming in to punish him for what he did. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that it opened up Kandahar and this notion that there is something else the, that as um, the the commander said, you know, it wasn't simply about this drug deal that went wrong in the park. At, there was more to it. So that is a really interesting little aspect that hopefully we'll see in to the Punisher standalone series on Marvel Netflix. Um, of course, the Foggy and Matt exchange, just so awkward, but so sad and poignant for me. I, I really enjoyed this as well. Yeah. I think for me, it, it was kind of just slightly pulled down by maybe just too many, uh, convenient dots being connected with regards to the, the burning ship leading to, um, Karen spotting the, the blonde herd, um, dead guy in the body bag leading to her spotting that same soldier on uh, the wall in a photo uh, with the blacksmith or Roy Schoonover and um, and Frank Castle uh, stood next to him recovering from a wound. And um, for me, that was maybe just seemed to be a bit convenient the way that was drawn and plotted out. But nonetheless, uh, it was good to see Karen really embedded now, I think, in the, the New York Bulletin. I mean, the editor, uh, Ellison, really is, this is your home now, he says. Um, so this is a really great development for Karen, I think, to be there. And again, just how the, the armory opens up and we have that iconic, uh, skull design in, um, presumably the, pu the Punisher's future body armor. Um, really, really cool. So a great, great, episode for me and um, there was just one aspect that just didn't chime right for me didn't feel just quite right but mm -hmm. that's how it falls sometimes absolutely still a great episode four out of five size in the eye so Derek, do you defend this episode of uh, Daredevil? I certainly do. This is a great episode and a nice way to close out a lot of the storylines. You know, we're going into still a big battle um, in the next episode, as obviously Nobu has set everybody on uh, on Daredevil. Um, but finally finding out who the blacksmith is, finally finding out what a black sky is. Um, very, very big points in this season and the previous season. So uh, nice to know who they are. I'd still like to know a little bit more about it. I'd still like to know, you know, you know, if Electra is the black sky, well, who are all the other black skies that the hand have trained? Are they also possible leaders? Is it like the Dalai Lama that anybody could be chosen around the world as being the next Dalai Lama? You know, is it like that? Only evil. <laughs> but I'd like to know a bit more information about that. Hopefully we'll get a little bit more uh, in next week's episode. But also I love the fight sequences in here. I loved the battle at the beginning between Electra and Stick, which turned into Electra Stick Daredevil, which turned into Electra Stick Daredevil in the hand. It was just like an escalation as we went on. And then Nobu joins mm, the fight. Absolutely. Um, not as good a fight in, from Nobu in this episode. I would have liked to see a little bit more of him, but with the promise is that we're going to see tons more in the final episode of the season next week. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think with that, it's on to feedback. 
Yeah, we had a bit of a discussion about this episode uh, over on our Facebook group uh, before we'd actually seen it. So uh, just some of the thoughts that were coming from from our group about the last episode and about this one. Warning, um, we may be completely wrong. <laughs> possibly. So I'll kick off our feedback with a little bit of feedback from Ronaldo on the last episode, episode 11 of, uh, of season two of Daredevil. Uh, Ronaldo says, while listening to the podcast... Um, he says, what was a real eye-opener for me was your discussion on Karen's role. The writers wondering how to rectify killing Ulrich and going beyond season one makes so much sense. I uh, also loved your discussion of Bullseye. Apart from Venom, he'd be my favourite villain. I think Bullseye has got to have a place in this world. Um, and I really um, can't wait to see if the shooter is Bullseye. And actually, I wonder if it answers one of the other questions. Uh, now that the blacksmith is dead as well, maybe um, it is Wilson Fisk who has ordered this contract killing out um, on Reyes in the previous episode, uh, given that he was looking to frame Frank Castle after his release from prison. Yeah. So maybe this is more of a Wilson Fisk rather than the blacksmith connection. Maybe. Maybe, or again, maybe it is Bullseye, uh, and he's going to go after the Punisher. Maybe that's the whole thing that he's trying to set up the Punisher. I think you made the point um, that there's could, potentially that could be the villain for Punisher series. Uh, Ronaldo just points out that there's a great story arc which has the Punisher versus Bullseye. Uh, they're usually epic confrontations, uh, so to see it on the, on the big screen or TV screen would be Amazing. Uh, Bullseye solo series drawn by Steve Dillon is a great read. He says, uh, it's such a scary villain and not in the I'm a total psychopath, unhinged killer sort of way, but additionally because of the fact that his con- he's conscious of the evil he does. On to a couple of thoughts about this particular episode before we'd seen it. Uh, David Wang contacted and said, if I were to tell you Black- Blacksmith is someone who had already shown his or her face in the series, who do you guess him or her it would be? Uh, we did address this, obviously, uh, on the last episode that we had Everyone from um, Melvin Potter to Wilson Fisk to Stick and then Bullseye in the discussion. Uh, <laughs> but we also mentioned, possibly by a bit of a scattershot discussion, we did eventually mention that it could possibly be uh, the former commander of uh, Frank Castle's group. Absolutely. Who, of course, is well known for playing bad guys. Mm-hmm. So maybe those big signposts um, should have, that is true. Uh, should have alerted us to this. But of course, yeah, he wasn't Starship Troopers. Yeah, wasn't he, but of course, you also you want to believe that they're casting against type in some cases. Yeah, uh, and David says. Um, I'd love to see the surprise look on your face <laughs> when you do find out who the blacksmith is. Um, well, if there is a similar surprise in episode 13 of Daredevil, you can see the surprise look on our faces when you follow us over on Google Plus or YouTube uh, for our final podcast, video podcast next time about Daredevil season two, episode 13 next weekend. Yeah, the final episode. And our final piece of feedback is from Doug Green, who sent us some feedback over on Twitter. He says, as a former reporter, I can tell you that Karen's not qualified to be a reporter either. I agree with Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, for that. And I think you might agree with with me as well. But I think my, my issue was always her involvement um, beyond being a legal researcher for, for the law firm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think now, hopefully, um, she gets a decent training from Ellison and maybe goes on, on some kind of degree course that can really teach her about journalism. Um, but certainly, I think sometimes that's maybe just the one aspect of Karen's character that you, you don't know that much about her background. It's yeah. only even been teased in this season about, you know, the, the car crash back at her hometown and the reason why she moved from there to New York to escape that kind of tragedy. And so you don't actually know an awful lot about Karen's background and that sometimes her motives and what she does Mm -hmm. is difficult to pinpoint and that free floating aspect of the character really sometimes makes it difficult to fathom certain aspects as well but um, certainly I'm liking her in the role of essentially being taken under the wing by Ellison almost as an apprentice you know he's seen a a skill that she's adept at and and is willing to really pull that out um, of her and and train her into this role. Yeah I think the point that I'd make is really that she's not a reporter she certainly isn't she's investigating one story for the bulletin because really 
the editor, Alison, has seen something in her that she's tenacious about this particular story. She's not working on the sports desk, you know. She's not doing uh, news stories. She's not She's not Clark Kent, you know. <laughs> she's not Peter Parker. Um, she is specifically working on one story. She's been given the office of the person that she got killed um, to sit in so that she can investigate this story. That's basically it. Uh, but Doug did respond to that as well and said, uh, but you have to have actual people to quote and they have to trust you, and that takes time. You don't become a reporter by just getting a job in the bulletin. Uh, totally see that, totally understand that point of view. Uh, thanks very much again for your feedback. I would quite like to see Karen's sports desk, though. It would be like she, <laughs> she, would, she would investigate totally. I can see the, her being a baseball fan. I could see her investigating why soccer players trip without even being touched. <laughs> like that there would be some big conspiracy within yeah. uh, the the teams the clubs and the players and, and probably betting certainly she wants to expose that that fraud i wish someone would and would make the game actually interesting to watch on that one <laughs> on that soccer bombshell <laughs> thanks so much for listening this week please join us if you're available on uh, on google plus or youtube next week uh, by just searching defenders tv podcast we will be broadcasting live from 11 a.m uh, gmt obviously uh, where our, our time zone is so just in case I thought you said gin and tonic time, um, <laughs> uh, which of course is not 11 a.m. Um, no, not unless you're on a maybe a, a stag do, uh, but <laughs> nonetheless, yeah, GMT. Yes, yes. Greenwich Mean Time or Irish Time, we'll yeah. say. Um, if you are available to join us, please come and join us and, uh, and you can add your thoughts as we go through the episode thoughts for the finale of Daredevil. Uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, if you're not going to join us, you can, as John mentioned earlier on, pick up all of our podcasts by subscribing to our iTunes link. Go directly through through uh, defenderstvpodcast.com slash iTunes to subscribe. Or if you're an Android user, you can subscribe on any other good podcast catcher by just searching Defenders TV Podcast on that catcher. Uh, please send us your thoughts about this or any episodes of the podcast by sending us feedback to feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at DefendersCast. Or, of course, you can join us over on Facebook in our group by going to facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV podcast. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you so much again for listening. Um, it's been a pleasure as always, and we'll speak with you again next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. This episode was directed by Eros Lynn, who's directed other episodes of Daredevil so far this season. Uh, it's also written by Douglas Petrie, one of the showrunners of the show, along with Lauren Schmidt. 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 Hisrich. Schmidt. Along with Lauren Schmidt Hisrich, who, who's up there. <laughs> along with Lauren Smith Hisrich. Schmidt. Smith. Along with Lauren Schmidt Hisrich. Hisrich. Oh. Along with Lauren Smith Hisrich, who's done a couple of other episodes this season. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you mean Lauren Schmidt Hisrich? <laughs> <laughs> and Douglas Petrie? Start off with him. He's easy. And Euros I Lynn. I got, I got Euros Lynn. It's Euros. Or White House. <laughs> and Sterling Lynn. <laughs> Dollar Lynn. Oh my goodness. Maybe we want to reconsider whether we do it live. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah.